There are a lot of opinions out on the internet on what the best tool, first tool would be for a home craftsman. Almost everybody out there is going to tell you a table saw is the best one to buy for your first major purchase. I'm going to sit here and say it's total hogwash. My opinion is a table saw is built for mass production. If you're... Now there's no need for you to have to endure me ranting against table saws. Maybe someday I'll write a blog post about them. A summary is, I personally think that they're a waste of time, money, and resources for the average artisan. And yes, I do think they are unsafe, not because the tool itself is unsafe, but how artisans use it. It's a tool for mass production. In that environment, the tool is set up once, and the technician is trained to, use, to make that one simple cut. Home artisans, on the other hand, we try and make it you, the table saw do way too many different things, and typically... We use safety shortcuts simply because we don't know how to set it up properly. The reason why I say the bandsaw is the best and really only power tool the average home craftsman needs is because it's infinitely flexible. Now just like I didn't make you endure my rant against table saws, you're not going to have to endure me raving for bandsaws. Let me just summarize by this. I feel that the bandsaw is infinitely more flexible. Uh, it's a lot safer in relationship to major accidents than it, compared to a table saw. Mainly because the power is being transferred to the ground and it's not coming back at you. And at the point of cutting, it is not a rotational force. It is a very linear force going into the wood. It also pays for itself. Not only are they cheaper to buy, uh, they're cheaper to maintain. Replacement blades are really inexpensive. And the first time you go to a lumber yard and buy rough sawn stock and resaw it down to what you need, you're going to start paying for it, Most of my it right are off the bat. Rough cut. Basically, I set up my bandsaw exactly like this all the time, and I pretty much never touch it. Uh, I put in a resaw blade. A fairly low tooth and it's a half inch. I set it up at 90 degrees to the bed. It's always there so I can come to it at any time and know I'm going to be making 90 degree cuts. Almost everything I do with the bandsaw is a rough cut. I, I, I use this as my apprentice. It does all the boring work for me and then I can take it to the joinery bench and smooth it, set the edges and do everything else. This is just a quick way to get rough cutting done and I do all three kinds of cuts with it. I resaw with it, simply using a fence, I'll set it down and resaw. Uh, I'll also cross cut, I mean I rip with it and I do a lot of ripping on it just because I find it extremely boring. Now with those two cuts I am constantly using the fence, the magnetic fence. The other apparatus I use with the bandsaw all the time, and in fact is how it is pretty much set up whenever I leave it, is with a cross cut. Unfortunately, this is a new bandsaw to me. Uh, I sold uh, my 10 inch recently and I gave away the cross cutting sled that I was using with it. Uh, repeatable 90 degree cross cuts is, the way, is what the sled is used for, just like on a table saw. So today let's build a uh, cross cut sled. Now a lot of people think that cross cutting sled shouldn't work on a bandsaw for one simple reason, blade drift. What blade drift is, is when, a, a, uh, when the blade goes, pretend that this piece of wood is the blade. As you're cutting with it, supposedly people say that because the teeth are typically at microscopically different angles at the back of the blade will move around and blade drift is the fact that you don't approach the blade at 90 degrees. You have to hit it at a certain angle for it to cut straight. I'm here to tell you I think that's total BS. Here's why. Most people don't set their blades up so that the gullets are at the center of the rubber tube that goes around. Now here's what happens. That rubber tube has a curve to it. The rubber band that goes around the wheel. There is a crown on it. If you set your blade up so that it is resting on the middle of that crown, it is going to drift for this reason alone. The front and back flex. Okay? Now, if you were to set your blade up so that the gullets of the teeth are at the crown, the back 
is free to move whichever way it wants, but the front will always stay at the same spot. So, blade drift is bogus based on what I'm, I'm demonstrating here because the back will flex to follow wherever the kerf is. Y'all ain't have to worry about the front. What I have found out in multiple blade changes over the years on different styles of blades or anything like that, when I set it up like this, it doesn't matter what the blade is, I always find out that the back follows the kerf that the front's made. It always ends up in the middle. So even I can cut at 90 degrees. That means that I can use the grooves on the table bed for my, be uh, for my sled. This particular one has two, which I'm excited about because it'll make it a lot more, a lot stabler. Now the material I'm going to be using on this project is just a two foot by four foot sheet of plywood I got from a big box store. I normally don't like using plywood, but for this situation, because I'm using both runners on my uh, bandsaw, stability is of the utmost importance. You could also use MDF or any other uh, material that isn't going to move very much. I chose plywood. I also picked up some screws with the little dresser washers because I wanted to distribute the force of the screw uh, and some leftover southern yellow pine I had and glue. And that's about it. Now the first step in building this cross cutting set is to cut the base. I'm doing the lazy route in that my plywood is two feet by four feet so I'm going to use this two foot width as the width of my cross cut sled. The length it should be just a little bit longer than the table saw bed. Uh, I'm making mine about six inches longer, just so it overhangs a little bit. The nice thing about doing that one is you can round all the edges, so if you ever bump a corner, it's not going to hurt so bad. So to make the rectangle, all you got to do is draw the line and make a single straight cut. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can use a jigsaw. You can use a circular saw. Heaven forbid, you could even use a table saw. I'm just going to use a hand saw, mark the line out, and, and start sawing. It only took a, about a minute to get through, so it's no big deal. Now, with the remainder plywood, cut about three strips out of the two-foot width. Uh, make them about three inches, and then glue those together. That's going to become the base uh, that you're going to register your work, work with on the jig. Try your best to keep it flat and at 90 degrees when you glue it up. Either use screws or clamps to do that. Now the next step in this project is making the sliders. The sliders are the one key thing that you just have to get right in this project. If there's any slop on in them, you're just going to be really frustrated with the sled and it's not going to be as accurate as it can be. Now as I said earlier, I had some leftover southern yellow pine to use. The key thing in whatever you select is you want it to be fairly stable. You want it to be a little bit thicker than your channel is deep and obviously you start out wider. What I did was I flattened one side of these uh, sliders then I set it the bandsaw so that I could rip them slightly oversized. After I cut them they would not fit in the channels. I then spent quite a bit of time going back and forth between the bandsaw and the workbench. Every time I went to the workbench I would take one or two swipes with my plane and then go back to the bandsaw and check it out. It's extremely important you don't overshoot it and make it a tad bit too thin because if there's any slop you need to start over. That's all there is to it. When they slide freely back and forth you know you've done a good job. Now you really can't tell in this picture but my sliders are slightly proud. They need to be a little bit proud and mine probably could be a lot, tad bit taller for the next step. We're going to actually glue these to the base and having them proud just makes it a lot easier. Now attaching the sliders to the base of your crosscut sled is probably the easiest thing in this entire project. Want to know why? I don't waste my time measuring. You've already got the slots uh, on your table saw. Why not use them? Uh, first off, remove the blade so that it's out of the way, and then lay some blue tape on either side of your channels. This will prevent uh, any glue from sticking to your bed. Now slide in the channels. Sl slather them up with glue. Make sure you get a, a good amount because it is going to soak in. And then simply lay your cross-cut bed on, the, on your table. 
Because those sliders are a tad bit proud, the pressure will be on the sliders, not the table. There will be good contact there. Uh, I, I put clamps on all four corners, uh, and in the middle, I just kind of trusted that it was fairly flat, and I pushed down a little bit. Now, this is a chance for you to wiggle it around a little bit. Personally, I would rather my crosscut sled um, extend over the outside of the bed a little bit so that I can support longer items. But that's entirely up to you. Just make sure that it fits on it. That's all there is to it. After a few hours, the glue should be dry. I suggest you slide the sled out. Don't lift it just in case uh, the glue is still a little bit wet. Uh, less less chance for you to pull the sliders off. Uh, remove the tape and if needed, take care of any glue that might have gotten on the bed. Uh, be, I use a little steel wool uh, and be sure and put a little WD-40 or some kind of oil on it uh, for rust prevention. Next, I'm going to put some mechanical fasteners onto the sliders. This involved pre-drilling a pilot hole from the bottom. That way the blowout will happen on the top. Uh, I use a scratch awl to make a little dimple so that the bit doesn't wander. Then flip the board over uh, and using some kind of bit, I used a Forstner bit that is slightly larger than the finish washers you bought and uh, create a hole uh, to recess it. Now this is the time that you need to measure out fairly carefully how long your screws are. You don't want to blow through the rail uh, so you make that recess however deep it needs to be so that you don't happen to do that. I also took this time to go ahead and flush cut the ends of the rails off uh, and using a little sandpaper I rounded them so that when, when I bump into them it won't hurt as bad. Now also before you uh, put the screws in you want to plane down the rails. Remember we had them a little bit proud uh, beforehand so that the bed would attach to it. So we want to plane it down so that they are not touching the bottom of the rail uh, of the of the grooves mm. on your bed. Uh, just a low gap is fine. Now it's simply a process of dropping the screws in to the dresser washers and, and drilling them down. Uh, the dresser washer will prevent the screw from blowing through too far and add a little bit more resistance. Plus they look a little nicer. Now once you've done that one, you're going to find out that the screws that you put in, even though they only go in halfway, they are going to swell the sliders ever so slightly. So that, that when you put the sled back in, after everything's dried up, it is going to be very tight. That is done on purpose. It allows you to fine tune it. Force the sled back and forth and you're going to find out that um, the high spots get burnished. So then you can simply take uh, a chisel, sandpaper. I personally used a, um, a plane uh, and just take off those few high spots and it will fit perfectly. Now here's a little tip. When you got it just the way you like it, flip it over, grab some paraffin wax, rub the rails down in the bed fairly good, then flip it back over, slide it in, and just bask in the glory of such a smooth sliding sled. The next step of cutting the slot couldn't be simpler. Just reinstall the blade and adjust it, lower the guide down, and then run the sled slowly through. Be sure you stop three-fourths of the way th through. You don't want to cut all the way through. Uh, we're going to use this slot to set the brace up uh, at a perfect 90 degrees. Installing the brace is just as simple. First, bevel the bottom of the brace so that you have a dust channel. Then screw one corner of it into the base. Slide a ruler into the slot and you can use this ruler as a reference edge for a known square. Then simply pivot the brace to the square and when you're happy with it, put a screw in the opposite corner. Then test out the cuts. You can always unscrew one of the edges to readjust it. When you're happy, drop in about three more screws. Be sure you don't put a screw in the path of the blade. Now is this going to be an accurate 90 degrees? I'm going to say it's accurate enough. If it's a half a degree off, I don't really care. This is a rough cutting tool for me, and it's probably more accurate than me hand cutting it. So there you go. This is how I leave my table saw pretty much all the time. I have the bottom of it coated with some wax and some WD-40 so it never really rust. I just leave it like this. I also find that 
it doesn't hurt as much when I bump into these edges because I am in a small little sh apartment shop. I leave it like this. You'll see me all the time. Come over here, cut it 90 degrees. Cut it to my measurement. Head over to the head, head over my bench. Grab my bench hook. Plane it smooth. Join it. Simple as that. I hope you enjoyed this project, and if you did, please subscribe and tell a friend. While the credits roll, y'all please remember, it's always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Be safe and happy.